Hi, I'm Kanoka, and I am a full-time artist and gallery owner in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Uh, I would be too young to remember San Francisco before my father and mother split and my dad took my brother and I east to be closer to his family. I was born in 1968, uh, a second son to artist parents. But my real first solid memories started um, when my father was dating the woman that would become the mother that raised me. She had an antique shop. Uh, it was fascinating. Uh, a, a building, an old rope mill from the 1700s, and it had three floors. And on the on the top floor, my father had an art studio. And this is some of my very first memories of being in that art studio with my father, alongside him, as he painted and I was painting, and I can smell his the scent of his cherry pipe tobacco. Um, sometimes there were things that were a little stronger in that pipe. But um, it's clear that I have been an artist since my earliest memories. I've always, I was born an artist. There was no choice. I've done many things in between, but I've always uh, have been an artist. Um, I knew that I was gay before I knew what to call it, before it was just from, I was always gay, right? So in elementary school, when all of the other kids were chasing the girls around the playground, I was attracted to the gym teacher. I, I don't know. I, I just, that's just the way it was. Um, I first heard of New Hope um, when I was very young. I, I'm going to say 10, 11 or something, maybe 10. Um, my father was working in a print shop uh, because he was a single father raising two boys. He had to work very long hours and sometimes he couldn't get a babysitter and we would hang out in this print shop with him, with all the guys working and whatnot. Well, all the guys were talking about what they did over the weekend and one testosterone fueled muscle bound Italian guy was bragging about how he and his buddies went to New Hope and threw empty beer bottles at all of the faggots. And this, in one sentence, this not only told me that there's a place where there's a name for me and there's a place where people like me are, but um, it would also be foreshadowing for the deep homophobia that I was going to encounter in my life. Um, luckily, in intermediate school, I did meet uh, my friend Jimmy. He was my first gay friend, and he had an older brother who was gay, so he knew a lot. And it was sort of a crash course into what is it like, what is it going to be like to be a gay person? And he would become my best friend. And... Um, until 30 years later, uh, alcohol would take him. Um, but I was very lucky to have him. Um, high school was hell. And mainly because I refused to live an unauthentic life. I was just gay. If someone called me gay, I would say, yeah, that's right. You know, I'm gay. And they did not like that at all. Um, my life was threatened daily 
Um, people wanted to beat me up or kill me. And, um, and just because I didn't want to lie, I knew teachers that were gay. I knew other students that were gay, but nobody would admit it. Nobody would be out. Um, it was the eighties. So w one thing that was helpful was that at that time, a lot of the icons that uh, were around were very androgynous. There was Boy George and Annie Lennox and, and Grace Jones. And these kind of said to me, okay, you can be gay, you can be androgynous, you can be, uh, uh, you know, blur the lines of sexuality and gender and still be a popular star. So that was kind of helpful um, in, keep, in keeping me strong and keeping me going. Um, I did take uh, uh, courses in fashion design and merchandising when I was in high school and I was starting to tinker with music as well. Uh, of course, I was in all the plays and I did, you know, I was in the drama club and, and things like that. Um, my first job, one of my first jobs before I got a car was at the Wycombe Inn. It was a restaurant and it was owned by a gay uh, couple. The, the, the chef was a lesbian. The, pa the pastry chef was gay. Um, it, the bartender was gay. The, it was the first time that I would be around gay adults that could guide me and protect me and show me things and see that you can be an active member in society and, and that would have nothing to do with your sexuality. So, so in a way they were like my gay family, my first gay family. Um, in fact, I was probably all of 15 or 16 when the bartender took me to the Raven for the first time. And I had had a boyfriend already for a little while. So I had some experience, but nothing could prepare, prepare me for what I was going to see at the Raven at that age. Um, it was eye opening and scary and, um, but at the same time, I was still very anxious to get a car and work in New Hope and be in New Hope. Um, I ended up buying my great grandmother's 1976 Chevy Nova and uh, I got a job at the Bucks County Association for the Blind Thrift Shop. So not only was I getting my funky clothes that I like to wear, but I was working at a, 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 at a thrift shop where I can just like I was driving donations and stuff like that. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And that led to a job where um, the owner of that place, her husband was working on an estate in New Hope and he was kind of like their pool person and he didn't want to do that anymore. So she asked me if I wanted it. So I was just, you know, around graduating high school when I got the job at the Hochberg estate in New Hope where I was their pool boy for 40 hours a week, skimming leaves and cleaning filters and whatnot. And the housekeeper there kind of was my boss and she would keep promoting me. The next thing I was taking care of their show dogs and then blah, blah, blah. And um, that, that family bought, they had display companies in New York and they, bought a, a shop in New Hope. They opened this shop called Sight. And that was, they would sell architectural furniture, like sconces and columns and things that were all faux finished. And they knew that I was an artist, I guess. And they asked if I wanted to help paint these, these things. And I was an apprentice under a guy that studied faux finishing in Italy. And that was my first real job as an artist. It was a dream job for somebody just out of high school. 
I could smoke pot all day and paint and it was it was fun you know it wasn't like a real job it was just amazing I could be creative and have a good time and just be me I grew my hair very long uh, it was almost down to my waist and then eventually I think they realized that my personality would be suited for sales so they put me in the store and I and I got to experience what it was like to um, have gay customers come in and be you know involved with the public uh, more and uh, eventually that store closed but I led it led me to work in many of the shops in New Hope including Love Saves the Day and and I even bust tables at the Raven um, when I was still underage. In fact, we were hanging out at the Raven in the 80s before we were of drinking age. Um, and so this would be like the late 80s, mid to late 80s. And um, I would meet all of the characters that made up New Hope. Uh, John Barra, uh, uh, Monique, and Danae, and Mother Cavaluch, and I always felt like an outsider looking in, like, there they are, there's all those personalities, there's all those characters, you know, and, and it wasn't until recently, in fact, when the Raven redid, when it was the new Raven, they put up all these pictures of all of the icons of New Hope and the people that make the fabric that is New Hope. And there was a picture of me. You know, there's Philip Nicolosi and Monica Ray, and I'm right there. And I, I was like, what the hell? I am also one of these characters. I'm one of these people that make, weave the fabric that is New Hope. I, but I've, I've never felt that way. I always felt like I was on the outside looking in. Um, but so it's inter it's just an interesting perspective thing. Um, I didn't have a real outlet for uh, either the music I was tinkering with or uh, or the art that I was doing. Um, so I was channeling all of my energies into making these award-winning, over-the-top Halloween outfits. It would take me three months to create them and they would light up or move or be made of recycled garbage. Uh, and it was way before any of these fashion shows or, or, or RuPaul's Drag Race. It, it was something that was not really seen and um, and way over the top. And I think it was just a glimpse at what was bubbling, the, the, the uncontrolled creativity that was bubbling under the surface for me. Um, but it was a lot, it was a lot of fun um, and a good release. Uh, I worked as a bartender at the Cartwheel from 93 to 2001, um, and I did a little stint at the Raven, at the New Raven in 08, 09, um, and all, but all the time, all this while I'm doing my artwork and music, um, and it was going nowhere, um, my music was very experimental, just like my artwork, you know, it was, what would it be like if you had this sound and a collage? And I looked at it very much like artwork. Um, and uh, my friend, Eric Rattuno, he set me up. He said, what are you doing? How are you doing your music? And I said, well, on this tape recorder. And he was like, no, no, you need these these programs. So he, so Eric Rattuno, who did the, the dance floor lights at the cartwheel, he um, set me up with some programs and all of a sudden I could now see my music in the computer and I can actually paint it like a picture, take a little away here and add a little there. And, and it was, it, it made visual sense to me. And 
immediately I was making um, music that would become scores to independent films, uh, documentaries, I did uh, meditation music, I produced a few people, I, um, you know, it was getting, you know, I was, something was happening with the music. But um, it, it was like a monicum of success. And, and what would happen is um, art would end up, you know, art would win in the end. A neurobiologist, Dr. Andrew Huberman of Stanford, has been doing these amazing studies about the effects of dopamine. Um, and what he found was when he gave children puzzles to complete, it didn't matter if they got the puzzle right, if the puzzle was completed at all, the dopamine being released from the brain was happening in the doing, in the process of figuring out the puzzle. So this old adage, this Taoist saying that it's in the journey and not the destination is scientifically proven. And it kind of explains how I approach my artwork. This is a good way to, this explained to me where my joy was coming from. Um, I'm only happy when I'm trying to figure things out, uh, when I'm trying new mediums and then stretching the limits of those mediums. Uh, I want to learn new things. I want to challenge myself. If it comes easy, I get bored. So, um, because of this, I end up working in a wide array of mediums. I work in everything. I want to try metal. I want to try clay. I want to, every time I see something new, I want to, I want to give an attempt to it. So I set up my own studio, uh, this way so I can work on several things at once. I have, uh, workstations. So as one thing is drying, I can be working on something else. Um, and it keeps me moving. Um, inspiration is coming all the time, at every moment, even in my sleep. I, I can't keep up with it. It's so fast that as prolific as I am, I, I would never be able to catch up with the amount of ideas that are coming to me. While I'm working on something, it's inspiring 10 other things. Um, I could just be doodling uh, like something, just like a little sketch, and then that ends up becoming uh, a sculpture. <clears throat> Speaking of doodling, I found some of my earliest saved work. If you come down here, you'll see. The these I made when I was maybe four or five years old, um, and I'm working in negative and positive space, surrealism, typeface. Uh, it's pretty uh, illuminating, and I still do crazy faces like this to this day. <laughs> so I haven't really changed much since I was four years old. Um, so like I said, each, each station is a different... Um, uh, thing I can work on block printing. Uh, I have my clay work going here. Uh, this is a resin clay that I'm currently obsessed with. So sometimes when I find a medium, I'll be working on that for quite some time uh, because I still haven't explored every aspect of what I can do with that medium. Um, the things in this room, some of it's going to go into my gallery. Some of it is sold already, and most of this stuff is going into a solo show I'm having at a friend's gallery. Uh, I do like to promote other galleries. Uh, I don't m care where you buy your art, just buy it buy it from a local artist that's living. Um, don't go to these stores, box stores, and buy mass-produced uh, prints you know, from a home goods, it's, this is, 
it's very important that you support real living actual artists. Uh, it'll help uh, it'll help somebody and it'll help the planet as well. Um, sometimes I, I worked in metal and I'll, uh, I'll do a little sketch of something. I'll project it onto a piece of steel uh, and then cut it out with an acetylene torch and, and, uh, and weld it with a MIG welder. Um, I'll combine a lot of my techniques. Uh, this has the resin clay, the, the steel, uh, all my faux finishing uh, work. Um, and so that is the studio itself. Um, and we'll go over and check out the gallery next. So all of my painting and mixed media work and stuff I do upstairs. And then down here is where I do my metal work. Some lost sculpture that never made it anywhere. Um, but it's been designed uh, down here to be flame proof with an exhaust fan so I can uh, do my cutting and welding and, and such. Um, the building we're in now was the hayloft to the property. I was lucky enough to buy this property four years ago. It's, uh, it's from 1850. It was the Detweiler Hay Farm. Um, my friends already had an established vegetarian restaurant down below which is amazing and beloved by the community. Uh, Nelly Ray's Kitchen. Uh, they, not only do they make amazing food, but they were able to make a community here uh, that was filled with love and uh, acceptance. Uh, you can, no matter who you are, uh, you can come here and be accepted and loved. And that is, a gem, it's a jewel. It's, 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 it's amazing. So like I said, in 1850, this was a, a, a hay farm, but about a hundred years ago, a doctor lived here with his family and he did uh, house calls with a horse and buggy out of the barn. Um, if you'd like to come and visit us, we would love to see you. We're 20 minutes, maybe, north of Doylestown. We're right on 611, as you can tell. So not only was I able to purchase the place and keep the girls here downstairs, but I was able to open an art gallery upstairs that features local artists. So we have eight rotating spots of local artists that I was changing out seasonally. So each season you'll have a new group of uh, local artists. We don't profit from the artists. Uh, it's a not-for-profit gallery. So the majority of every sale goes back to the artists themselves. Um, and in the four years that we've been here, I've been able to help over a hundred artists. And that's the gallery. And um, I have in the only ongoing exhibit. My stuff is always here. My father's stuff is always here. Um, and we'll take a little peek into the Kanoka art room. So in here, you'll see. It's like my mind has exploded. You'll see everything that I've done, all the works, all my experiments and whatnot. You'll see all the mediums I work in. 
um, and you can come and talk to me about my work. I'm very happy about um, giving advice, uh, helping people. Uh, so come and talk to me about, about anything. Um, some of the things that I overhear about my work is, is that they, they compare it to other artists. Is, are you inspired by Henry Moore? Are you inspired by Keith Haring? And sort of, I think what happens is during my lifetime, everything that I've ever seen, everything that I've ever dreamt or experienced goes into my mind and how it comes out. I don't know. And maybe it's partially inspired by these artists, these incredible works, but, um, but it's just a jumbled mass of ideas. It could be and also inspired by whatever medium I'm working in at the time. Um, but if I was to give advice to upcoming artists, I think the most important thing, now I, I, I could talk to you for hours about things that could help you, but if I had to narrow it down to one thing uh, is be authentic, keep doing your work. Don't stop doing your work. Uh, do plenty of it all the time. Um, and be authentic to what you love to do. Um, it, it's, this might be hard to hear, especially in the digital age where we beg for likes, but don't accept compliments and say thank you, but don't let compliments or insults affect your work. Um, you can't be so consumed about, is this going to sell? It has to come from a place where you need to do it. I would be making artwork whether or not I was selling it. And I think that's what makes it so good is because it's coming from a, 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 a place of authenticity. Uh, and that reads, when you look at a piece, you know if someone's just trying to make something to sell something, you know. Um, so just be... Be original and, and stay true to your nature and keep doing uh, what you're doing. One of the great things about having my own gallery is I can have my father's work here too. These are his carvings. Um, and it's kind of a full circle moment, right? So not only it not only has my father been my first and strongest influence, but now I can have him here with me at all times. Um, these are all hand carved. There's, there, it's done with hammer and Japanese carving chisels. There's no Dremel or electric tool involved. And um, the cutest thing in the world, you know how a parent would send a kid some money in an envelope for their birthday. Well, I got to send him some money in an envelope for his birthday. Uh, the Japanese have a saying, and it's called Ikigai. Ikigai is your life's purpose. And it could be represented as a Venn diagram of four circles. What the world needs, what you love, what you're good at, and what can sustain you. And in the center is your Ikigai. So what the world needs to me is artwork. What these artists need are representation. Um, what I love is making art and helping people. Uh, what I'm good at is not only creating artwork, but I was born for sales. I love people. I love being around people. <clears throat> I love helping them find the perfect piece of artwork for their home. And, uh, and it sustains me. So here's hoping that you find your ikigai. If you like this presentation, uh, there's two others so far. Uh, Bob Egan did an amazing one about Odette's and Damien McNichol did a talk about growing up in Ireland and his new book. And he knows how to spin a uh, yarn, so that was fascinating. And New Hope Celebrates History is a nonprofit itself. So if you wanna support 
them, you can donate to them, and the if you love that they're archiving this kind of information and spotlighting artists in Bucks County and beyond. And you can come visit me at the gallery, or you can follow my social medias. You can do uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and stuff like that. So thank you, and uh, much love. <laughs>